So uh, welcome. And last time we had uh, covered some basic concepts with uh, co-products that built on our discussion of products. Uh, each examples of universal constructions. These um, category theoretic um, constructions here are patterns uh, that exemplify some universal property uh, in the sense that exemplify a property that holds true for um, all, all objects, for example, within a category. And products and co-products are um, kind of close cousins of one another. They're duels, in fact, of one another, um, sort of like matter and antimatter. Um, um, and one is a limit and one is a co-limit. Um, uh, now, in the same underlying lecture uh, for programming with categories, uh, there was also reference given to uh, exponential objects, um, which uh, have like products and co-products, uh, a like all universal constructions, universal property, but they they all also have uh, representation in the pseudo category Hask, the category we refer to for programming, um, uh, as as meaningful uh, quantities, uh, quantities that are readily um, appreciated. Um, and uh, last time we, we talked about some elements here, but these concepts uh, have their slippery side. And uh, we decided last time, you know, spending some more time on these would, would probably be good before rushing on. Um, so I put together um, some extra examples um, and an attempt at trying to communicate um, some intuitions for these things as well. That, hopefully will be borne out across those examples. Uh, so we'll, we'll spend more time in these uh, today, particularly concentrating on some of these um, particular kind of exemplars of them to which we can refer, both in SAT and in other categories um, that are a little bit easier to get your head around, like pre-order categories, uh, cate categories uh, associated with um, Hask. Okay, so um, with that being said, I'm going to switch uh, switch my slides here. Um, I actually didn't create an entirely new deck; rather, I supplemented the additional deck. And and actually, I went back to session nine and and put in some some things there as well uh, for future renditions of that. Um, so uh, I don't want to rush things. Um, we'll spend what time is needed for people to feel comfortable. But um, we may get to uh, exponentials today as well. Uh, we'll see. Um, so this material and discussion is all based on this uh, lecture seven of uh, programming with categories. And last time I mentioned some themes associated with it. And within that lecture of programming with categories, uh, you'll recall that um, uh, the leaders of that course uh, the instructors had um, gone through an interweaving of categorical concepts with uh, Haskell instantiations. For example, here with product being captured as a pair. Um, and within this particular lecture, um, co-product was also introduced. Um, and um, we had um, noted, uh, excuse me, um, that its instantiation last time was was this either or either object. Um, and uh, as with product, uh, there were, uh, there was this particular pattern associated with it that's illustrated here. Um, so with products, we had, we're taking the product of two objects in a category, call them A and B, and I've put them in, sort of highlighted them with this reddish pink color. Um, and uh, we're seeking uh, the product of those, uh, 
those particular objects A and B, which is itself um, variously referred to, and one has to be careful with this, as an object, this object A cross B, but more technically, more correctly, it's this whole pattern here associated with it. It's, it's the morphisms as well. Um, so we might informally talk about this being the product object, but really we got to we got to rec recognize that it's with reference to this pattern that it's defined. Uh, and that we, if we talk about a mapping between products, we're going to be talking about a mapping between these sort of, um, not only just this object, but these morphisms out of it, these so-called projection maps, whose job in life is simply to extract uh, a component um, from each projection one, projects down the A component of this to A and B to this. And in set, those literally just extracted the second element of the pair or the first element of the pair variously. Um, we have to think a little bit more generally when we apply this products to other categories like pre-orders where these are not functions, but just an indication say one thing is less than or equal to another thing. Um, uh, but um, but this pattern will hold um, in any category. So uh, in a pre-order category, A cross B will need a link to B as well as a link to A. This one to B will be saying it's less than or equal to B. This one to, um, uh, to A will be saying it's less than or equal to A, okay? Um, and we saw that the sort of defining feature, the universal property here is that for any other object that is equipped in the category C, that is equipped with two morphisms, F and G itself to A and B. So anything else that sort of meets this pattern, um, this product A, A cross B is, is special in the sense that there is, has to be a unique morphism a unique, not only it exists, but it's unique from C to A cross B for any other such object. A cross B is kind of the, that is the special or the, the privileged one, the distinct one, the, the, the one that stands out, the exemplar one, and any other one has a unique morphism to it. In other words, C can get to A and B, but it can do so in a way that is factorized by, that's mediated by this. Um, and, you know, I, I gave reference informally to this idea that, you know, A cross B, um, when we compare it to the co-product, it's helpful to think of their relationship to A and B here. So these are the things we're trying to, of which we're trying to take the product. And A cross B is upstream of them. I say that in the sense that the, the stream flows down from A cross B to A and, and from A cross B to B. Um, so it's upstream of A and B. And in fact, in, in many categories, like pre-order categories, it's useful to think of this as the closest mediating object. There may be other objects uh, that mediate A and B that that can lead to both A and B, like this one C, but this is the closest one. The others kind of uh, that that mediate all have a unique morphism to this. Um, so this is the one that's closest to A and B, while at the same time guaranteeing this relationship. So it's upstream of A and B. This is product from a, any category C. Okay, um, and uh, co-products within these categories um, are defined in what looks to be overall kind of a similar morphology, a similar overall pattern visually, if you flip back and forth, and I'm gonna do it at the cost to give you vertigo potentially, um, going back and forth here. Um, but you'll notice the, sal the most salient difference here is what? What's the big difference between product and co-product with respect to this shape. You see this kind of um, lenticular shape for each of them. It's kind of like a lens shape um, uh, or a Star Trek logo for those who are sci-fi fans. Um, 
So what's the biggest distinction between product and this one? What's the, the most important distinction here? I'm gonna, to avoid this throwing you off, I'm just, oh, I'm just gonna label this as unique. Oh no, that's my Zoom link. Um, uh, so uh, there, this should say unique morphism as well. But what's the what's the biggest distinction between these two? It's the fact that the what go in different what. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. The morphisms go in different directions. Okay, the opposite direction. That's why we say it's dual to it. Co-product is dual to product. Dual in the sense that it's the same lenticular shape. It's just all the arrows are flipped. The one that was from A cross B to, to B is now from B to A plus B. The one from A cross B to A is now from A to A plus B. The one that was from C to A is now from A to C. So it's the same basic diagram, uh, except they're headed in the right, the the reverse direction. And I should have emphasized, I, I stand remiss for not emphasizing that um, not only does any other object have to have a unique morphism going this way for product, but this, this needs to compute, this triangle needs to commute. In other words, uh, H and then pi two or pi two after H um, has to be equal to G and uh, pi one after h, that is coming down this path, h and then pi one has to be the same as f. That distinguishes this as a product and it's similar here, um, except here things are reversed. B, uh, if you go from B to A plus B to the co-product of A and B um, as an object and then h, it has to be the same as g. And again, I'm just talking about this as the co-product object informally, really it's the, the pattern. Uh, here. Um, these things have to commute. So these two have to compose to be the same as this. Whatever G is, um, if we have this link here and, and this unique morphism here, uh, for this to be the genuine coproduct, these two things have to compose to that. We know any two morphisms in a category have to be able to compose to another morphism in the category. But what this is saying is something very particular. These two have to compose to be G, or these two have to compose to be F, okay? Um, and the key distinction that I wanna make here at an intuition level um, with some of these annotations is products, we have A cross B being upstream of A and B. And you could say for, for many categories, it's fair to say it's the closest mediating upstream object to, to both A and B. By contrast, for, for A plus B, the co-product, considered as a, informally as an object, it's kind of the closest meeting downstream object to A and B. A points downstream to it, B points downstream to it. And it's the closest one. And where these were projection maps, these are injection maps or insertion maps is a common term. Um, so in, in set, what, what these serve to do is like, if you have an A, you could insert it into the first component of A plus B. That'll be kind of like saying left in Haskell for a Haskell either object. If you have a B, you can insert it or inject it into the second component here by saying right, and it'll, it'll be stored in the right one. This is a tagged union. It not only remembers the value from A, but it remembers that it was from A. Hmm. Um, so here, co-product is downstream, as when considered informally as an object. Product is upstream when considered as an object. Um, uh, and an intuition that I can't remember if I emphasized last time, but it's a really useful one in my view, um, is that, look, you can view product and co-product as kind of summaries of A and B. They kind of summarize at a certain level things about A and B. 
me summarize some kind of characteristics of, of A and B. Here we're summarizing what A goes with, with, with what B. Um, we need both of them to form this product. We're kind of summarizing what, what, what A is going with, with B um, together. And it kind of summarizes A and B as it were. Um, uh, this is, if you have a A being a bunch of things and you know, a set of possible things, and uh, sorry, A being a set of possible things, B being a set of possible things, A cross B is a set of pairs of A and B that are possible. It, it keeps track of what goes with what. The co-product is also can be viewed as a summary, yeah, but a different summary. Like in set, the co-product provides a way of remembering the elements of A and B and which came, which came from which, uh, whence they came. Um, so A plus B kind of allows us to remember what's in A and what's in B um, uh, and from which they were derived. This is the tagged union. It's not a union, but it's a tagging that keeps track of whence they come. Um, so I have a, uh, and yeah, this was product um, in set, and we talked about projections, uh, co-product. Uh, I don't, I don't know if it as nice a picture drawn out, but there were some from the diagram that gave a sense that really, look, this is keeping track of tagged contents here. So we keep track of whether this is Bob's apple or Alice's apple, or Bob's pear or Alice's pear. Um, we we keep track separately. And all of them give rise to this mapping. This mapping is from A plus B to C. Okay. Um, and David Spivak talked about this last time and how co-product is like the product. It's just enough to, to give you all the information in C and D with respect to what their elements are from whence they came, which one it, uh, given element came from, um, without being too much information without being unnecessary information. If it were any simpler, it wouldn't be able to describe an arbitrary C and an arbitrary D. And if it had more cruft in it, like an extra element here in the co-product that we didn't need to summarize these, it wouldn't be unique in mapping here to any object C that had these links. Instead, this is the Goldilocks. It's just right. It has just enough uh, to exist and not too much it to, to, in a way that would make it non-unique. Um, anyway, that, that was some uh, essential elements. My thought was to go through some examples here building on this, but are there any questions regarding how I phrased this? Because I phrased it differently than last time and I emphasized some intuition here about summaries and you know upstream and downstream kind of mediating objects. And I, I want to let you ask some questions about this for either product or co-product. Any questions I could address with respect to this before we dive into some concrete examples? Any questions on this before some examples? Okay. Um, uh, okay, great. So if, if there's no example, no, oop, hey, get rid of this out, out, black spot. Um, come on. Oh, man. Um, okay, now I'm, now I'm really wedged. Um, so come on, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, okay, so let's let's talk about some examples. So co-product is downstream. I I, I know you, you'll think this is silly perhaps, but um, product is upstream, co-product is downstream. How do you remember that? How do you avoid flipping it? Well, like C is close to D, right? Like <laughs> co-product is downstream, D is even the next letter in the alphabet. Product is later in the alphabet, P, it's close to U. 
so it's upstream. Um, um, it's it's a you know silly little mnemonic perhaps, but I, I find mnemonics helpful, and I think it's useful to avoid some some obvious mistakes. Eventually, you'll acquire an intuition about this from thinking about many examples. But what is um, okay? What would uh, coproduct be in a Boolean pre-order category? So here we have true pointing to true and false to false, just not drawn because they're implicit, they're identity morphisms. And this is a Boolean pre-order. So there can only be zero or one links between objects. And here we have no links from true to false, but we have one link from false to true. So what would the co-product be? And again, I'd, I'd, I'd mention it's the closest downstream object to both of these recognizing downstream could be a and b itself that's something i i emphasized here it could be that um it it could be that it's one of a and b um the co-product so what would the co-product be here what do you think got to be downstream of both a and b and kind of the closest downstream thing. What do you think it could be? What rule involving two objects would make it downstream? So if we have false and false, we kind of went through this. What is it? It could be potentially false, um, uh, it, it needs to be false, right? Because uh, true, it would be downstream, but it's not the closest one, right? Mm -hmm. um, false and true, what's the closest one that's downstream of both of false and true? What's the closest one downstream of both false and true? Anyone? Come on, someone could volunteer an answer to that. True. True. Good. How about true and false? What's the closest downstream one for that? Also true. Also true. And how about true and true? What's the closest downstream one for that? True. True. Okay. Now, does that sound familiar? Uh, if you have false and false, it's false. False and true, it's true. True and false, it's true. True and true, it's true. What does that sound like? The logical what? Or. The or. So co-product of for for a Boolean pre-order where you have this um, for any two objects, the co-product is the Boolean or of them. What would product be? It's here our product is the closest upstream object. Um, if we speak about that being informally speaking, that, that being the product is really the whole pattern. Um, what, what would the closest upstream object for false and false be? What's the closest upstream object from them? Uh, false. False. What's the closest upstream object from false and true? We need an object that's upstream of, of both of them. So what would that be? Also false. False. And true and false? Also false. False and false. And true and true? True. True. What does that sound like? So false and false and false. False and true uh, and false. What? True and false. It is the logical. And. And. Logical and. Okay. So product in a Boolean priori category is and. 
co-product is or, which is sometimes why, have you ever wondered why you write and as like times and or as plus sometimes? I don't know if you've seen that, but in electrical engineering, that's, that's quite common. Um, so kind of goes along with this. Okay, here's divisors of 30. No, we, we talked about this last time. You may just remember it, but you know it's it's worth rehearsing it in your mind. So for product, we're dealing with the closest, well, I'll say co-product because it says it here. So let's do what it says first, and then we can depart from it. So for co-product, we're looking for the closest downstream object of any two objects. So two and three, what's the closest downstream object for two for two and, and three here. Six. Yes, yeah, six. And for two and five. Ten. Ten. And for two and five, uh, sorry, for three and five. 15. 15, yeah. By the way, before we, in, in this one, we had like false and false, it's false. Why isn't two and three, say two? Why, why, why is that not closest downstream? Here, you know, we said false and true, it's false, for example. Why, why can't we just say two and three, it's two here? Why is that? Because there's no arrow from three to two. Exactly. It's not downstream of three. We need something that's downstream of, of both of them. And they have links, they have, you know, identity arrows, just like anything else, but we need something downstream of both of them. Um, that's why when we did false and true, we, we need to do true before. But here we, you know, two is not downstream of three. Three is not downstream of two. So we need this six. Okay. So two and three, it's six. Three and two, it's six. Two and I'm oh, sorry, of uh, three and five, it's fifteen. How about two and five? Oh, sorry, yeah, um, yes. Uh, okay, so we 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 did uh, each of these. Okay, um, so 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 that's that's good. Um, and how about six and ten? What's the closest downstream one for that? Thirty. Yeah, 30. Okay, so what does that smell to you like? This is kind of like... It's actually a three-letter acronym for it. Least common multiple. Least common multiple. It's the smallest thing that is a common multiple of both of those. And what is product here? So let's do product. Product is the closest upstream object, right? P is close to U. <laughs> okay, okay, great. I shouldn't laugh at that. I mean, it's really quite useful when you're, when you're learning this stuff. It's great. I, I think it's great, personally. Um, wish I remembered that when I, when I started out. Um, okay, so, uh, so let's do two and three. What's the closest upstream object? One. One. Good. Um, and three and five, it's also one. Well, also one. Okay. How about how about um about six and ten? Oh my god. Okay. I'm, I'm, Internet connection is causing dysfunction. This is exhibiting dysfunction. How about six and ten? What's the what's the product of those? It's the closest upstream object. So what would that be? You need an object that's upstream of both of them. 
of both of them. And we want the closest one. What would that be? Uh, two. Two. And six and 15? Three. Three. And six and 15? Mm, six and 15. What would, what would it be? Uh, three. three yeah okay now I, I was kind of playing with a straight jacket here how about like there's nothing that says we have to do it in a row how about two and 30 what's the closest what what's the product of those two it's the closest upstream object that's upstream of both so two and 30 what's the closest one uh, one okay it might be easy to think but there's another one it's even closer to arcing back oh. to what we saw here to itself. So this way two is actually this. I was asking a lot of questions here within a row and maybe a way that blinded you to the fact that actually you wanna remember like one of those objects could itself be, be it itself. So if we had considered the co-product, the co-product of say two and 10, what, what, what would the co-product been? Co-product is closest downstream thing of two and 10, what would it be? 10. 10, yeah. So uh, product two and 30, it's easy to think it's one, but it's actually two. Um, it's the closest upstream, I'm oh, sorry. Yes, for product. It's the closest upstream object, yeah, which is two. Okay, um, so what's the rule here? Um, uh, earlier it was said that we had least common multiple and for product, it's what? It is the, so six and 10, it's two. Six and 15, it's three. Um, six and five, it's one, etc. It's the greatest common divisor. It's the greatest common divisor. Two and 30, it's two. Two goes into both two and 30, right? Six and 10, it's two goes into both of them. If we did two and 10, it'll be two. If we did two and 15, well, it'll be one. It's upstream of both. Two is not upstream of 15, and 15 is not upstream of two, so we have to go to this. Greatest common divisor. These seem familiar it's for good reason. Oh, look at this. Reload. Let's, let's, oh my God. Uh, this was a nice one. This was one of my, my faves. Um, hmm. I don't know what's going on here. Um, can you see it on my screen now? Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is really uh, quite, quite unbelievable. Uh, maybe it'll show in presenter view. It uh, doesn't look like it. Um, okay, well, you can look at it here. Okay, this is a fun one. What is coproduct in the category of natural numbers? So here we have objects that are natural numbers. Mind you, there's a mono where we can represent objects as, as morphism, but that's a separate thing. This is the category where each object is a natural number. Yeah. Every natural number has exactly one object representing it. And there's a morphism. This is, oh man, I say natural numbers, but I should really say the pre-order category, uh, natural numbers with less than or equal to. Um, so that's what a morphism means. Zero is less than or equal to one. One is less than or equal to two. Two is less than or equal to three. It wasn't specified as a category of natural numbers. Okay. Okay. So. What is co-product here? What is co-product? Remember, co oh, is close to D. Uh-huh. Huh? Maximum? 
Maximum. Max. What's that, Alex? I heard max. Yeah. Yeah. So any two numbers, it's the maximum of those. So we want the thing, the co-product. We want the thing that's downstream of both, um, but the closest one. And of one and two, it would be two. Of two and three, it would be three. Of one and three, it would be three, because it needs to be downstream of both. But you can always use the, the maximum one because it's downstream of itself, and it's downstream of the other one. So the co-product here is max. What is the product? You want to guess? What's the product? Product, remember, upstream. We want the closest upstream thing to the product. Well, so if we do three and two, what's the closest upstream thing? Bearing in mind, it could be one of them. Two. Two. How about the closest upstream thing of three and one? One. One. How about if three and zero? Is it going to like dive a null pointer exception? How about three and zero? Zero. <laughs> zero. Yeah. So it's the what? The minimum. Minimum. Min and max. And this is why I say it's kind of like a summary, or this is one of the motivations for why I say it's like a summary. Like max summarizes those two numbers. Min summarizes those two numbers. And, and here we kind of summarized with GCD and LCM in, in a certain way, those numbers here, we kind of summarized the two numbers in different ways with or or and, we summarized them in, in a different fashion, right? Um, it's pretty cool. We have these summaries. Um, and in general, when, if we had these uncountable numbers of these, like real numbers, the summary would, wouldn't be the max. Cause like, if you have an uncountable number of the, like, how, how are you gonna take the maximum? There's always one more. So what you do is you take the limit. So if you have everything between zero and one on the real line, and it's like, um, you know, and it's all this, you know, uncountable number of, of things in there. The summary, if you have between zero and one in there, the summary is, is one or the summary is zero. It's, it's the limit of them. It's, you know, they're, they're approaching it. And it's, it's, it, it, it doesn't have to be one of them because here it, there would always be, well, in case of real, there'd all be, be something more. So it's the one just, you know, just at the top. It's downstream or upstream of them. So in general for pre-order categories, it's the greatest lower bound is product um because it's upstream and co-product is the least upper bound that's kind of what we were doing as a general thing here and to me i mean this is incredibly cool here um okay let's let's try this let's hope hope it presents okay here's some sets there be some sets okay these are this is a category of sets of inclusions associated with um power set of four um, under bar. So this is the set zero, one, two, three. Uh, yeah, I'm okay. I show my roots as a computer scientist. Sorry, mathematicians. Uh, I'm counting four under bar here is going from zero. The main thing is it has four elements, but this could be, you know, uh, banana, um, you know, horse fly, <laughs> you know, uh, um, cell phone and um, house or something like that. Um, it, it doesn't have to be any anything too particular. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, here we have uh, this category and, and a given any two objects represent the appropriate set and uh, an arrow a morphism from A to B indicates that A is included in B. And we count kind of the empty set as kind of vacuously being included in anything here. So like two is in one and two, and it's in zero and two, and one and two is inside, oh, zero, one, two. It's also inside one, two, three, but it's not inside this and it's not inside that. So it isn't shown. 
Okay, what are products here? What's the product? Okay, P, it, we've got to look for the closest upstream thing. So suppose we had two and zero. What's the closest upstream thing that's upstream, the closest thing that's upstream of both, but it's the closest one? What would it be? Zero and two. It would be empty set. Uh, okay, yeah. So empty set would be those. That's in both. That's exactly right. How about the co-product? So here, co-product. We want the down closest downstream thing. What would it be? Set of zero and two. Yeah, zero and two. Okay, let's try it with something. Uh, how about one and three? What's the closest upstream thing? One and three. Because upstream Empty thing is what? Again. Empty set. And what's the closest downstream thing? Set of one and three. Yeah. Okay. Now let's try some things between rows. How about three and zero and two? So this one and this one. What what would the closest upstream thing be to that? Empty set, I think. Empty set, yeah. What's the closest downstream thing to that? The set zero, two, three. It is. It, it looks to me like there's a, a yeah, zero, sorry. Sorry, no, I was going to say there's a missing link, but there's not. It's zero to, uh, to uh, mumble, mumble here. Yes, that's correct. And it's downstream through this way of this one. Uh, and it's downstream through this way of that one. So it's downstream. Yeah. Um, are you starting to see a pattern here? How about three and zero and two? So, uh, sorry, three and zero and three. What would the closest downstream thing be for that? Zero and three. Yeah, zero and three. Okay, how if we were to take the product of one and two and one and three, what's the closest upstream to both one and two and one and three? One. One, yeah. Okay, so anyone would want to speculate what is the Pro, sorry, the co-product here. I should have done them one at a time. What's the co-product here? Looking for the closest downstream thing to both. What Union. Would that be? Union, exactly. What's the product of any two? It's the... Intersection. Intersection. Anyone need to discuss this more before we go on to something with partitions? To me, that's like incredibly cool. It's about as cool as Max and Min emerging from this, or LCD and or LCM and GCD, um, and and or. Okay, so you see how these common things we've been dealing with for years are, are just manifestation of products and co-products. Okay, so here we have a set of partitions of a given set. Um, I can't remember what R, C, and O stood for. I think this is, this is like um, uh, this is like children, reproductive age, and old age. I know what it was. Yeah, that, that's why I chose that. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so um, what is the product here? Remember, for product, we're looking for things upstream. What's the product here? So if we take the product of this guy and this guy, or this guy and this gal, what, what's the product of them? The closest upstream thing. What's the closest upstream thing? Follow the arrows. 
this is a, sort of a, a circle around this indicates these two are joined. We're considering, you know, these two are joined here. Uh, this is a partition of RCO. One partition. This is one possible partition. This is another possible partition. So what? What's the closest? What's for product? What's the closest upstream thing to both? Look for something upstream that these two are both downstream of it. What's the closest upstream thing? Anyone? Uh, closest upstream one is this one. Each of these is distinct. And you could kind of think of it, okay, if anything is distinct here, we'll make it distinct. So O is distinct here in this one. R is distinct here. And well, each of those are distinct, so C has to be distinct. Mm. What's the what's the what's the closest? So what's the product of this one and this one? Mm -hmm. So this one and this one, what is it? Probably should have labeled these with like A, B, C, D, E or something. So you could call them something. What is this? Well, the product of this one and this one would be the first. It's upstream of itself by definition, self arrow, and it's upstream of this. So it breaks out everything that this breaks out. When we took the product of these two, we have to break out anything that's broken out in either of these. And that's what we've done here. How about the product of this and this? Anyone? Product of this one and this one. Uh, it's the one on the right. The one on the right, because R is broken out in it. OK. So that's kind of interesting. So product here. You could say it's this rule. If it's broken out in either, we break it out. I mean, I don't have a better way to say it, but you could you could also probably say you could get away with saying it's the intersection of these things. Um, like like if you lay this on top of that, it because this thing is split apart here, it splits apart. It's kind of like the and of these. Not surprising, these are all products, intersection and. Okay, how about how about a uh, co-product? What's the co-product of this one and this one? We want the closest, for co-product, we want the closest downstream thing. What's the closest of this and this? The top one. Top one. How about the closest of this and this one? These two. What is it? The left. The left one. Middle the left. One here. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, sorry. 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 Um, yeah, this this one. Exactly. So so the closest downstream thing, the downstream of both of them is this guy. Mm. Um and but if we were to take yeah, well, we already took these, this and this, it's this. So what is that? If you had to describe that, what would that do? What would that be? If either has something joined, we have to join them in the result. So here, if we're doing this one and this one, if these two are joined in, in this one, the result has to be joined, so we get this. If we were to do this and this, well, this one has this joined, this one has these two joined. So C has to be joined with uh, with O and C has to be joined with R. And so it just happens that you have to have, have these all in one blob. You kind of merge the blobs. Whereas in the product, we kind of split the blobs if anything were split. 
So once again, we see kind of product and co-product as ways of summarizing two of these or splitting. And there are, one of the reasons I was inspired to do this is that because we, we deal with this sort of thing in our models all the time with stratification of compartmental models, right? If one model is stratified so that children and reproductive age individuals are, are grouped, another one is um has all three separate and we want to somehow merge them then we need a model where those two are joined together because we don't have finer resolution than that or if we have data of different sorts we can't really say what's going on for each of the groups so we have to fall back to the kind of minimum we have in any of the, the constituent data sets or what minimum resolution we have so this comes up quite a lot actually in modeling i find okay now Time is, is getting close here, but here's a fun thing. So we introduce separately terminal and initial objects mm. um, uh, as universal properties. And we introduce them separately than product or co-product as a universal property. But it turns out that they play nicely together. Um, and they, they have properties with respect to each other, they're not just solitudes. Okay, so here we have a product. We want to take a product of any object in a category with, um, with uh, a terminal object, which we denote as one, um, and in that category. And suppose that we want to find out what's its, what what object we might informally call its product. What's at the apex of this? Or the, yeah, the sort of the root of this, uh, this guy here. Okay, so here we have a one. Um, and we want to have a product like this, product object, such that this triangle commutes and this triangle commutes. That's what we needed for, to be the product. What thing would serve as product here? Anyone wanna say? What thing could serve as product here? Well, this is a what. What do we know about any terminal object? If we consider a map from any object to a terminal object, what do we know about that map that's kind of a special map for a terminal object? What does it, it comes out of its universal property. Terminal object is a universal construction, but it's associated with the universal property. What was that universal property? For any other object, there exists a what? What is it that makes it a terminal object? Hmm? A morphism from any other object to the terminal object. That's right, object. exactly. And what sort of morphism? Not just any morphism, it's a unique morphism. There's only one. I mean, you think about it in sets or, or hask, if you want, where this is unit type or sets, right? It's a one object set. There's only one thing. If you have another set, there's only one morphism, only one possible function that you can have from that other set into a singleton set. Just for any possible value of the other set, it just uses the only possible value that is. You may remember this when we first tried to build intuitions about functions. If you have a singleton set, like there's only one function to it from any other set. And, and in general, for a singleton object, there's only one unique morphism. It's not any morphism, it's a unique morphism from C to this. Okay, so you might say, well, that's very nice. So this morphism is unique. There's only one of them. It's, it's given, it's fixed. We can't do anything about it. It's, it's the only morphism it can possibly be. Whatever value C is, it's gonna be one. There's only one of them, okay? How about pi two? Well, we can say the same thing, right? This is, this is fixed. This one is, is fixed. Um, so it turns out these two are unique, but not only that, because we have this morphism from A to A here, it turns out that kind of the, 
I mean, if you have an arbitrary A um, morphism and, and you have the A here, the only one that's, that you're gonna have and still have this exist, the only one that's guaranteed to exist is kind of ID here, the identity mapping. Um, and we, in order for this to serve as the kind of the product, what you have is this is uniquely given, this is uniquely given, this is some function f, and we can have this be id. So f composed with the id is just f. On this side, f composed with the only thing it can possibly be is the only thing it can possibly be here from c to one, it, there's, there's nothing else. And, and that in general is going to be true if you compose with a this sort of unique mapping to the singleton, you get a unique mapping to the singleton. So it turns out this commutes. And if, if you look, it turns out what this is saying is this object is isomorphic to this one. In other words, the functions that come into this one are the same as the functions that come into that one from the same object. I shouldn't say function, I should say morphism. So what this is basically telling, and I went a bit fast here, is that A, A cross one, this sort of product object here is the same as, essentially it's isomorphic to A. It's basically the same as A. And look in set, this kind of makes sense, right? Like if you take the product of like a pair, of a natural number and a one element set, you haven't added any information. The second element has to be what it is. So there's no new information there. If you have an element of this, it's just this extra baggage that's fixed. And essentially what you have is something that's isomorphic to that's the same information as in the natural numbers. Um, what, what would this be in Hask? What, uh, so, so what is a product in Hask? It's a what? It's a, pair. Pair, it's a pair. This is like a pair with the singleton object, okay? It's a pair with singleton um, is what this is. Um, so uh, that's, that's what this uh, corresponds to. Um, okay. Um, okay. Uh, so here, A cross one is basically the same as A and the product uh, across SAD, across HASC, um, across the, um, you know, any category with a terminal object is isomorphic to A. And the same thing you could say one cross B, across B is the same as B. Um, now, I want you to think through, I think I'll make this an exercise. Um, I'll give you two of these. What's the co-product of any object with the initial object? So you have, if you have, this is the initial object, what's the co-product of any object with it? Um, by kind of analogy with this, and remembering the properties of the initial object, you should be able to get a feel for what, what this co-product might be. Um, and, you know, I'll tell you these things play nicely with the rules. Um, and we'll see that with algebraic data types, they play nicely um, with the rules of algebra. Um, so you should be thinking kind of what's the analogy, not only to this in Hask, but what's the analogy to this in Hask, et cetera, and in set. Um, so this is like an either in Hask, either something of type A, say either of int or what does zero correspond to in Hask? Anyone remember? Begins with a V. Void. Void, yeah, exactly. So 
So you should be able to reason this uh, through, try reasoning this through, okay? Um, but what we're seeing here is universal constructions um, that we define actually have relations to one another. And things like products um, have well-defined rules that come out of their structure when we use them with respect to other universal objects like terminal objects or initial objects. And some of the rules of arithmetic come exactly out of this relationship. Um, you might also ask, what is the product of A with zero? What is that? Um, and I'll ask you to, to think, try, try struggling with that for a bit. Okay, I think we'll kind of continue on this before going on to the, the next lecture because I want to cover exponentials. Um, but we'll finish up with, with these sort of relationships and then we'll talk about um, uh, kind of lifting functions via bi bifunctors and exponentials next time. Um, I might ask you to review an extra video or two uh, separately um, on these constructs. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you folks. And I look forward to talking um, next, uh, next time. Uh, and I'll see if I can get this exercise out to you. So thank you very much. Take care there. Thank you.